Welcome to Capitol Report, a weekly discussion with your elected officials on the issues and concerns that affect you. Good evening and thanks for your time with us. I'm David Nicholas. Governor Rick Snyder moves to closer to appointing an emergency manager for Detroit. What impact might this have statewide? Also work underway on the budget, including a proposal for some increased funding to address the problem of dredging in the harbors and the waterways. That and more with our, my guest this week, State Senator John Molinar, the Republican from Midland, currently serving in his uh, first term for the 36th District. Welcome, Senator. Good to have you here. Thank you, David. It's nice to be back with you. We start at the top in the news from just this past Friday as we sit down uh, today. Uh, Governor Snyder's agreement with the financial review panel that Detroit is in what is labeled a crisis and the plans moving to appoint an emergency manager, the city with 10 days to appeal that decision. Uh, do you think they will possibly maybe having any other plans to deal with the problems there by keeping control of the city there? Well, I think the challenge is that the city finances are out of control. And this has been a very good faith effort on behalf of the governor, uh, and who has assigned the state treasurer, Andy Dillon, who's been looking into this matter, has been working with leaders in Detroit to try and find a solution. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the conclusion was there really isn't a plan that is uh, viable at this time. And so because of the emergency nature, uh, that was the recommendation to the governor. Uh, Detroit would become the largest entity here in this state, and I think some reports were indicating that it could be um, the largest nationwide to be put under this type of control. Um, from your vantage point, as, as Michigan is starting to move towards signs of recovery, what would the perception be, do you think, of Michigan's largest city, the signature city that, that so many people identify one with the other, Detroit with Michigan, Michigan with Detroit, uh, to now being in this kind of state? Well, there's no question that it does not a positive perception. Um, when you take a city that in its heyday was over 2 million people, and now that it's down to 800,000, when uh, it was a thriving economic base for our state, it's now uh, challenged with crime, with uh, lost jobs, uh, lost people leaving the state, crumbling infrastructure. There are many challenges. Uh, the most difficult part of that is that the city council there and the mayor have been able to not to resolve the financial crisis and as a result they have unfunded liabilities uh, not paying their bills and inevitably are headed in this direction and so i believe the best thing that could happen is for responsible leaders both on the state level and the community level working together to try and resolve this in a constructive way, but it takes goodwill on all sides. I think our governor has really demonstrated that he, in both his uh, approach, which has been a very patient approach, uh, fact-based approach, uh, working with the state treasurer, Andy Dillon, on this, uh, I think has, has set the right tone. Let's see what the leaders of Detroit want to do and which direction they want to go. Pontiac and Flint uh, have been under the control of an EFM, <clears throat> but as we said, this is is Detroit. What what do you think the the ripple effect could be because of its prominence in the overall state economy? We don't have a single economic engine of of the auto industry driving everything in this state as it did for so many years. But uh, in all the communities, say even to, to use an example, a, a small business that might be somewhere, many of them within your 36th district that were suppliers to companies in Detroit. What does this change the, the nature of any of those relationships as as the nature of Detroit trying to to finally come to a fix? What what can be that effect then statewide for those that still do a lot of business with the city? Well, I think the people who have been doing business are not getting paid. And I think what this is doing is bringing to light a problem that's been growing over time and, and has not been addressed. And so I believe by bringing this to light, by getting creative ideas, people of goodwill trying to work together, in the long run, uh, Detroit could move in a positive direction. There are some very uh, strong business leaders in the Detroit metro area who continue to invest in Detroit, try and do creative things to bring the city back. But now it's time for the government leaders in the city to really step up, take responsibility, and work in a constructive way so that it fosters an environment 
where people want to live there, people want to invest there, and the economy there can thrive. Given the scope of it, have you had people specifically telling you, as you said, we're not getting paid? I mean, have there been, well, have there been dry spells where, where some of well, these smaller firms, that, that's been a situation? Absolutely. The, uh, both the city government as well as the school system, um, I can still remember asking one of the leaders of the school system, you know, how, what are your unpaid liabilities uh, that you owe your vendors? And the answer was, we don't really know. And so to me, that's a troubling scenario. What this is simply doing is shining a light on something. Yes, it is not attractive. Yes, it does put Michigan in some ways in a bad light, but let's solve the problem because we need a healthy Detroit, a thriving Detroit. And I think the governor's on the right track. And has that happened up into your district too, where company XYZ and community ABC has not um, received a specific payment from trying to do business? I'm, I'm not aware city. of any suppliers in, in my district. Uh, most of the people in my district are not doing business in Detroit. What, what I find, though, is there are different pockets of leadership in Detroit, and all uh, have the opportunity to contribute something positive to the situation. And, you know, sometimes people view politics as a partisan Democrat, Republican. Uh, I think in the city of Detroit, what needs to happen is all the various factions, not based on political party ideology, but simply on needing to come together in the spirit of goodwill to solve the problems for the city. Have there been discussions outside of, of uh, the governor specifically and, and, and working on this with State Treasurer Dillon to, to solicit any opinion from, from any of you at state government level to, to work together to find any uh, solution? Are the discussions gone that way? And I, and I think of the quote from former GOP presidential uh, nominee Mitt Romney who taken out of the full context of the statement, but uh, the dubious quote was, was paraphrased as let Detroit go bankrupt. There was a wider context there, but the, the, the feeling that the problems had gotten to a point where something drastic needed to happen, either with the auto industry as a whole, the city uh, in, in its own right, is municipal bankruptcy then something that, that could conceivably still happen? And to that, I mean, emergency manager being one issue, possible municipal bankruptcy being another, where do you see this possibly you know, going? And, and you'd probably have to have a lawyer to determine all the similarities and differences of what a uh, emergency manager is able to do uh, in this process versus what the courts would do in a bankruptcy process. But the similarities are that you have a troubled financial institution uh, without the capacity or the ability to, to resolve its issues. And as a result, uh, people are being har harmed in the process. And so uh, whether it's the emergency manager who could come in and work with the entities to solve the problem uh, or the courts uh, ordering it and mandating it, uh, I always believe that if you can have someone in there trying to help solve the problem, working with all the parties to resolve differences, that's probably better than just having a bankruptcy uh, going through the courts and a judge just issuing a, 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 an order and, and that's the end of the story. So um, what the city of Detroit will decide on that, I don't know, but they are certainly in an emergency financial situation. I believe the governor, uh, by providing this option and giving them the flexibility to choose is doing everything he can do as the top elected leader in the state to try and uh, bring leadership to the issue. Directly to the level that you and your colleagues do operate with, and that, that is the state budget itself. If we, if we look at even something as, as uh, basic as you know, bills regarding revenue sharing, does this potential change for the city of Detroit impact any more of the overall state budget process? Because the, 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 the situation there being altered, does it have any, again, I guess to use the term ripple effect, mm -hmm. into what's being done for a state budget as a whole? It, it clearly does have a ripple effect. Uh, at this time, there's not a proposal before the state legislature in terms of uh, funding, uh, or somehow trying to improve the financial picture of Detroit using state dollars. Um, I'm sure that as this process goes forward, those requests will come. Um, you know, the state already puts a lot of revenue sharing money into the city of Detroit. 
um, and you know to be used for these kinds of purposes. You know the concern is, uh, you know how how much should the state be liable for a city's mismanagement of its funds? And and but those are questions that'll have to be addressed at a later date. The main thing right now is for them to to stop the hemorrhaging and uh, right size their government, and and then see what can be done to improve the economic position to grow the state out of this or the grow the city out of this condition outside of this then um, for the for the budget itself uh, the proposal obviously is, has been out now for a few weeks um, what has been done what is what is scheduled here in the next couple of weeks that's coming before either well in this case obviously particularly for you the Senate side uh, before the spring recess on March 25 sure well, the, the year sets, starts off in Lansing with the governor's uh, State of the State address, which he gave in January. He gave his budget message in early February, and now the legislature is in the process of working through that budget. It's about a $51 billion budget for the state of Michigan. Um, we, in the process as it works is that the Appropriations Committee takes the lead on that, and various subcommittees have hearings. We're in the middle of those hearings right now. Usually before spring break, we would make a recommendation uh, from the subcommittees on what the budgets should look like from the legislators' standpoint, and then they'd go to the full uh, Senate uh, sometime after spring break. And then by summer, uh, the goal is to resolve the differences between the House and the Senate, and then go to the governor for a signature. And, and as you know, in the last couple of years, we've been really on target uh, letting people know what they can expect from the state budget and what they can expect uh, from those who receive funds from the state. Uh, in the past, we've stretched that out into October and even had government shutdowns. But really, we've made a lot of progress on that front. I expect it to be a uh, similar uh, time frame again this year. Any particular budgets that are the priority? Is it, is it looking at the $51 billion as a whole, or is this being broken down into some of the individual uh, departmental concerns? Well, the two, the two key areas that are probably the most at the forefront that the governor's budget recommendation included and the legislature now has to wrestle with, uh, the governor proposed additional funding for roads and put out various ideas on how that funding might be obtained through registration fee increases and various fuel tax increases. Uh, there have been a variety of increase or proposals to increase, whether it's the sales tax or other means. Um, those are being digested and evaluated in the legislature right now. And what are the folks in District 36 telling well, you? So I, there's a lot of roads in uh, that district. Sure. What are people telling I, you? You know, I can tell you that people are concerned about their roads, but they're also very concerned about their financial situation. And right now, the proposal for a registration increase, increase or a fuel tax increase has not gained much support at all. And so, uh, you know, I'm someone who believes we want to dedicate more funding towards roads, but first we should look within our state government budget and say what can we increase in terms of dedicated spending towards roads living within our means before we start asking the taxpayers for more dollars. One other thing that did come up was a call for $20 million to go towards the, the dredging of harbors. Um, you've introduced a bill that would allow money to come from the Natural Resources Trust Fund to pay for that work to be done. Uh, tell us about that proposal and how it's either are linked or, or significantly differ, differs from what the governor himself sure. proposed. The governor is proposing using funds that are already in existence um, and basically changing the priorities within when projects would be done. And so he's identifying emergency dredging situations. For instance, in my district right now, uh, there would be two uh, situations in Alpena and Harrisville that would be considered emergency dredging situations. Now, on the on the forefront earlier was a grant that would allow East Tawas to be dredged as well. And to me, that's an important priority as well. Now, if we do two out of those three, then the one doesn't get done. What we've realized is because of the, the lower uh, water levels in our lakes, uh, we are in a situation where we need to act and act swiftly. And so I'd like to see all this done. Um, the Natural Resources Trust Fund is a pretty tightly held fund that use, 
is used to fund different projects based on natural resources and recreation. And what the bill that I introduced is basically a, a bill that says that dredging so that people can use these harbors for recreational purposes is a relevant use of those funds and consistent with the intent of how those funds should be used. So whereas many people would say, well, yes, that's already uh, allowed or consistent, we wanted to spell it out in state law so there was no question because uh, it's important that we get this work done as soon as possible so that we don't go year after year with uh, not being able to use those harbors. Some critics came out quickly saying, though, that it would, uh, any such provision would immediately drain that down to nothing. Uh, bad pun, I suppose, a bad choice of words, but would take, the, take all those resources from the trust fund to target towards, one, because of the magnitude of, of where the levels are at of the dredging that needs to be done, that all of the, the resources trust fund would be used up to deal specifically with dredging. So does this allow for a, a hybrid in paying for it from what the governor is calling for and, and then as needed or going to the trust fund as a priority to come up with the money needed to, to move ahead with, as you said, in, in a situation where it might be sure. getting all three done in, in an area or two out of three or, or whatever yeah. the case may be. Well, I, I would be interested in, you know, we just introduced the bill and it'd be interesting to know as we do an inventory statewide what, what the degree is and the need there uh, and how that would impact the Natural Resources Trust Fund because we certainly could limit that if that were the case. At this time, I'm not concerned about that. Anytime you bring up an issue of spending, um, there will be people who, if they don't benefit directly from that spending, may oppose it because they have an idea on how that money should be spent elsewhere. So what I intend to do is, as this bill moves forward is to, to have those hearings and make sure we are able to do to accomplish our goals and, and protecting and preserving our natural resources and making good use of them for all our citizens. U.S. Senator Carl Levin's been calling us over the last couple of years wanting to talk about the fact that he has been trying to get access to what he says is a sitting, unused, whatever, for whatever reason, $2 billion fund through the Army Corps of, of Engineers to address specifically this and has raised concerns as to why that money hasn't been unlock to go towards this here and, and elsewhere. Any connection or, or could there be any link between what you, the governor, is asking for or, or contact with the senator to, to see if his proposal on the federal level could take care and, well, and address any of this? I think we should definitely be working together and, and looking at all the possible resources. And, you know, that's one of the challenges when you have different uh, protected funds that are used for specific purposes. Uh, sometimes those purposes are so tightly defined that you aren't able to do some of what needs to be done. And so hopefully uh, good judgment will prevail and we'll be able to use those resources. The Natural Resources Trust Fund is basically capped at this point because there's a lot of funding in there. Um, so the goal would be let's use our funds and make these kinds of investments at a time when there's an emergency and, and let's preserve the in, uh, original intent of those as well. People always talk about uh, the rainy day fund, whether we've used it all up, whether we find ways in, in some sort of budget reorganization or, or a surplus of any kind to put money back into there. What, what are the, I mean, you're talking specifically about the Natural Resources Trust Fund. What right now is the, the state of that rainy day sure. fund and, and what are the feelings as to how we should or should not be using that? Well, the, the rainy day fund in Michigan is at about a half a billion dollars. And, so that is a significant accomplishment over the past two years that we have gone from a structural deficit to putting a half a billion dollars in the rainy day fund. At the same time, you have pressures that are emergency needs. You know, some would argue that would be the roads. Some would argue that would be dredging. There are a host of other areas that that money could be spent. So Probably some saying Detroit, if we go back to, to where we started this yeah. conversation. And, and what I would argue is I think it's important that we have a rainy day fund. I think it helps us get an improved credit rating, which allows us to borrow uh, paying less interest. Um, it sends a positive message about Michigan around the country that we have our fiscal house in order. But if there are things like roads, uh, infrastructure needs that if you neglect them, they continue to get worse on an exponential basis, then maybe that's a place where you would use that 
those rainy day funds as, as an investment in the future. So that'll be something we work on in the legislature with the governor and uh, help set those priorities for the budget. But I think it's a significant new day when we have that kind of money in our rainy day fund. We talked about where things are currently uh, with committees addressing the budget. Um, you're the first senator to join us in this current season. House members um, have been telling us about new or, or reappointed positions that they have. For the committee assignments that you have, uh, give us a rundown of what those are, sure. maybe if there's any particular highlights coming out this week or next for issues coming up before sure. those particular committees. Well, one of the, we talked a little bit about the Appropriations Committee, and I chair the Department of Community Health Budget. Um, also I'm the vice chair of the overall Appro appropriations committee. On the military and veterans affairs policy committee, I chair that committee and one of our goals is to really reach out to veterans and make sure they have access to the benefits that they are entitled to. Uh, you could cover a wide range of employment opportunities, educational opportunities, but right at the forefront is health care benefits. A recent study came out about a year and a half ago that listed Michigan right at the bottom in terms of our veterans accessing federal health care benefits. So in working with the governor over the past year, we've proposed in the governor's recommendation a new agency that specifically focuses on reaching out to veterans, identifying who they are, making sure they're aware of what services to which they're entitled, and especially important as these Iraq and, and Afghanistan veterans return home that we uh, provide those opportunities to them. So I'm excited to work with them on this and our committees working to try and uh, give credit for the uh, military service so they can more easily enter into the skilled trades and other fields because these are, are great people to have in our state and uh, leading the way in our economy and, and so often when they come back it's hard to plug in. So we're going to make a real concentrated effort on that. Is any of this tied, there was, there was an announcement a uh, couple of weeks back now from the Secretary of State's office about uh, some easier access, whether it's yes. processing or, or information sharing, something ad addressing that so that veterans would have access to services. Any, any link between the two? Y exactly, and, and I was at the press conference where that was announced, a new photo ID, a new uh, license, uh, driver's license, the designated military. The department has also received a federal accreditation, which is new, that allows us to communicate with the Fed's database to know when veterans move into our state. But yeah, one of the challenges is, you know, let's identify who our veterans are, where they're living, and communicate with them the relevant information, and, and then we'll be able to serve them better. People are always concerned about uh, what's going on in, in K-12 schools. Um, you said as we sat down uh, today that uh, there's a regular meeting with uh, one of the RESDs within your district. Any particular concerns that they might have? Um, there, there are, of course, always the local concerns, but, sure. but uh, statewide as well, uh, or, or at least region-wide for District 36, what came out of that meeting? Sure. Well, we had a general discussion on the budget, but then also about some of the regulations and rules that they're required to follow. And it was very interesting to hear their perspective on the federal requirements, the state requirements, uh, local requirements, some that are put on by the legislature, some by the State Board of Education, the Department of Education. And when you add all that up in the classroom, that's a lot of teacher time, administrator time, filling out reports and, and making sure the all the paperwork is done and and really what we want to do is streamline that and make sure that our teachers are having time with students and really uh, students engaged in the learning process and so the more we can streamline that give flexibility in the curriculum that was another topic of, of uh, Senator Representative Joel Johnson has some important legislation on uh, giving flexibility to school districts for kids who want to take more in the area of career and technical education or um, kind of the skilled areas and, and, and I think there needs to be more flexibility. Sometimes the one size fits all doesn't really engage students and, and our goal should be to really help each student be as productive and as engaged as possible. Well for the trip from that meeting to join us here and then on to Lansing for the rest of the session uh, this week to, to address the budget and other such things. We appreciate you taking the time to uh, sit you. down. It's always good to see you. Thanks a lot, David. Appreciate it.
And thank you for your time and attention as well. Our guest here on Capitol Report has been State Senator John Molinar from Midland and the 36th State Senate District. A reminder that our program is rebroadcast in the overnight uh, following uh, our airing here on Tuesday nights. You can also find the postings later on our website. Click on the TV link and to the specific Capitol Report page. Thanks to all the TV uh, crew that uh, are on hand for the production here this week. And uh, we will be talking again soon. Remember, you can always send uh, comments and feedback as well. My email links are right there on that same Capitol Report page. I'm David Nicholas. Thanks for joining us. You've been watching Capitol Report. Join us again as your elected officials speak to your concerns on current issues.